Thank you. Welcome, welcome. This is the session. Um, as you can see from the title, Topic 141, Your Mouth and Radiation Therapy. I would like to introduce Dr. Chambers. He is Chief of Oral Oncology and Maxillofacial Prosthodontics in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He is the Vice Chair of Research Compliance and Regulatory Affairs. His clinical research efforts include studying the effects of stimulants, antibiotics, and enhancing the body's immune system to manage dry mouth and injuries to the mouth caused by radiation and or chemotherapy. Dr. Chambers earned his DMD and an MS in Biological Sciences at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. Dr. Chambers is also a psychomedical advisor. Thank you so much for this presentation and welcome. Thank you so much, Barb. And it's very good to be back with, um, with all of my good friends from Thyca and all of, uh, I've, I have uh, literally over these many, many years have, have had so many good friends that are uh, patients as well that I have um, befriended over the, uh, the many presentations that um, I have uh, been um, able to give. And so I wanted to start off by thanking my dear friend, Gary Bloom, who has uh, put together just another phenomenal meeting for you and for the, the world in um, cancer survivorship. And I owe a great uh, deal of, of gratitude to him and to your organization for all the great outreach that you do and bringing so many of us from comprehensive cancer centers, particularly at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And quite a few of us are on your program these next few days. And I appreciate you being here uh, today as well. So a big shout out to Gary Bloom, my dear friend. So my financial disclosure, I have no disclosure to, to provide. Uh, today, I want to speak generally on oral manifestations and complications that we see with iodine-131 therapy, and also with external beam radiation uh, treatment that's given for uh, various uh, thyroid cancers and metastatic disease, and talk a little bit about management strategies. What intervention do we offer today uh, for a variety of these oral, uh, oral challenges? And a little bit about some future um, therapies that we see as promised for uh, the next generation of care. So this particular slide speaks to general uh, complications that we see in cancer uh, treatment, and particularly when you have had an element of a radiation uh, component to your therapy. And with radiation, many times you'll end up with uh, challenges in the head and neck area if the radiation is focused in that region or if you're um, being given a specific amount of iodine-131, this can manifest itself into having changes in the salivary glands, in the soft tissues and heart tissues of the head and neck, and most definitely in the, um, in the teeth and the gums and just general health and general comfort of the oral cavity. I'm gonna speak a little more about dry mouth and uh, that we classify as xerostomia and then swelling of the major salivary glands that we call sialadenitis. But there are a, a great number of other complications that can occur, and we've written about it, we've studied it, we continue to study these manifestations and what we can do potentially to help in reducing the, uh, the challenges that come forth uh, from, from these treatments. So, we know for a fact that radioactive iodine, when you have doses that are greater than 100 millicuries, you will have an impact on salivary gland output. And for majority of, of patients, this is a decrease in salivary output that actually lasts for years to come. And the higher you get and the repeated doses that you get, of course, the more dysfunction that actually occurs. So for the majority of the data that we have pulled for many years, we see that it's somewhere between uh, 15 and 20% when you have had doses that have been higher than 
100 millicuries of radioactive iodine um, that has impact on salivary gland function. And that has a downstream impact. It has a great deal of a, of a change, particularly in how major salivary glands function and how they, um, how they assist you for eating and oral comfort and fighting bacteria and fungus and viral contaminations. Saliva is so important. Saliva is more than water. It's a complex bodily fluid that's so important for each of us in helping us to control so many of these uh, changes that can have impact in our GI tract, in our, in our bowel, and just general um, health in the upper aerodigestive digestive tract. So I wanted to tell you some of our earlier research that I've presented at this meeting for many years is that we've had such an interest in what occurs when you have a drying impact in the mouth. And when you have a drying impact in the mouth from radioactive iodine, and particularly for those that have the iodine treatment that's then eventually followed by an external beam radiation, patients will see drying, a, a drying impact. And what we see um, in the, the downstream um, impact of that is increased contamination of the oral cavity. And where you can find that the oral cavity and in the aerodigestive digestive tract, you can tend to see a great shift in the oral ecology, the oral microbiome. And that can have a major, um, uh, again, challenge towards the health of your teeth and the health of your gums and how food tastes and the comfort of swallowing and aspiration and dysphagia and others. And so we know for fact that uh, it's magnificence in therapy to destroy tumor cells, the side effects are real and the side effects are still here in 2022. So this earlier trial showed us in our data set that we tend to have a substantial increase in organisms in the oral cavity and in the throat when you start to have a drying impact, particularly from um, iodine 131. And what we see and continue to see now over these past, uh, I would say 60, close to 60 years, about 58 years of, of collecting data on this um, in this particular area is that when we have had treatment and we then follow a patient for several months and we see a decrease in overall salivary function, it typically denotes that the patient is having an impact also with having sensitivity with, uh, with their teeth, having easier uh, tear of soft tissues. Gingivitis is more prominent and prevalent. And that's true for when you stimulate salivary function, such as chewing, or when you're resting, and it's what we would call unstimulated salivary function. We see a decrease in both with iodine-131, and this has been proven over the many years that our techniques may have changed, but the impact to the salivary gland has still had a, um, an overall demise. And most of our patients that are going to be under 100 millicuries of therapy you routinely will have recovery that is much faster in the salivary function and its impact in other glands, uh, more so than you do when you get uh, that dosage above 100. And then repeated doses, as I said um, earlier, can really also strongly change the comfort and also the ability to defend yourself against bacterial and fungal contamination. So these studies that are going to follow have just continued to be so influential in how we see what radioactive iodine treatment can do. And it's what we're gonna call radioactive iodine ablation in patients with uh, thyroid disease. And what we have done in trials is we've looked at scans that show the output of a gland secretion through what's called skintigraphy. And we look at it before and after the iodine introduction, 
And then we also determine what's the patient encountering over a period of time is towards dry mouth. The other in parallel to that is cavity formation if, or cavities of teeth and sensitivity of teeth. We also see a direct impact as the mouth decreases in salivary function and organisms increase. Typically, we will see that uh, teeth and their enamel and their dentin can actually cavitate and cause more sensitivity and more struggle. And again, in these earlier trials, we did see that patients that are anywhere again between 100 and 150 millicuries of iodine therapy will usually have a lasting impact that their salivary secretions will always be impacted and the quality of the saliva has an impact. The higher the dosage, the more the impact to the quality and quantity of salivary secretion. Under 100, you usually see greater recovery. But uh, most of our trials, we try to uh, look at the function of the gland for several months to years. And we want that longitudinal data so that we can really see what is the lasting impact. And what we have found, again, the higher the dose, the more uh, the complication and the longer the complication is present. So study after study, that we have continued to assess is that not only do we see the diminishing impact of salivary output for many of our patients, but also with regards to the anatomy of the glands that secrete and give us uh, all the, the, the need that we have for oral comfort, for being able to have good taste acuity and et cetera, and again, iodine treatment at the higher doses can lead an individual into having some of these complications, particularly on the drier mouth side. Now, the iodine 1 therapy, 131 therapy, and other iodine treatments uh, don't have the same lasting impact as what external beam radiation treatment will do. However, there is um, a change that occurs. And it occurs relatively uh, quickly once the, uh, the ablation has been done. And in our earlier trials back in 2000 and 2005, we uh, showed evidence of what actually occurs with salivary function from the ducts of major salivary glands narrowing and having its impact with the 131 therapy. Now, we have correlated that with external beam radiation treatment, and external uh, beam radiation treatment is much more challenging to the, um, the anatomy and the ductal systems of salivary glands and the blood flow to teeth and the health of the bone and just the rigor, let's call it, of the important structures of the mouth, the tongue, the cheeks, the floor of the mouth all get a diminishing impact of, of blood flow once radiation is given at a certain uh, dose. So external beam radiation treatment can also give an individual uh, side effects that can both be short-term and long-term, and a considerable number of these are actually long-term that will last um, for years to come. And what we want is, um, although that we now know what some of those complications can be and the type of individual that most likely will have more of a challenge going into therapy. It's that early intervention that really has a major um, impact on benefit. And so although there are therapies are as they are to destroy tumor and to be able to um, destroy tumor quicker, and giving a great deal of impact at the beginning of, uh, of the therapy with regards to tumor killing, it does indeed have a great um, impact the earlier we see patients on the oral oncology side or the dental oncology side of helping an individual, particularly for those that will continue on with treatments for several months. So we this laundry list that you're seeing in front of you is what we have studied and published and confirmed what is a short and what is longer term 
uh, changes and what we're going to call chronicity. So I want to jump real quickly now. Uh, that's kind of just wetting the appetite of what some of the research that we've done and, and us knowing that we definitely can see changes that occur uh, once a person has had treatment um, with either 131 therapy or with radiation treatment and or chemotherapy. We see it also on the immunotherapy side, may I add. But I, I wanted to really uh, fine tune that saliva, which is what we have spent a great deal of our time in researching, is more than water. And it's truly a complex bodily fluid that helps to give what we're going to call homeostasis, really a, a, a balance in the, in the oral cavity to help control early digestion, to help control a breakdown of food, to help control taste acuity. So the, the, the faster that one gets into treatment and having higher uh, dosing being given, we of course want to be able to educate our patients, to let them know what it is that we would like them to do in order to enhance um, all of that, which we're removing uh, from our therapies, by our therapies, and it starts by education. So saliva is more than, than water, it's a complex bodily fluid, again, that gives us a great deal of benefit. When we see the drying impact, in the oral cavity from the variety of therapies that we uh, will afford a patient. We also see that uh, we typically, as the mouth dries, we usually will start to see an increase in more harmful bacteria and a decrease in more beneficial bacteria. And yes, we do have beneficial bacteria. Bacteria is so good, particularly some, for, um, some species for early uh, digestion and early breakdown of food. However, if we should decrease and change the oral microbiome, it can give such an imbalance that it can lead to greater changes with, with reflux disease and having uh, tissues that thin and are easier to tear and become more susceptible to conditions that are white patches and red patches that we call leukoplakia or erythroplasia. These are challenges that can happen. And like what you see in front of you on this slide series is that fissuring of the oral tongue, the drier your mouth becomes, also becomes a haven for bacterial contamination and just oral pain. And that can be very, very uh, struggling as well. The other is with cavity formation and sensitivity of teeth. That too can occur the drier the mouth. The drier the mouth, the greater the environment and the pH of the oral cavity susceptible for much more harmful bacteria. So again, something that we want to make sure that our uh, patients are educated and being able to uh, reverse course for some of these contamination challenges. So the salivary microbiome, which is made up of a great amount of organisms, um, is, uh, again, can be quite beneficial. And if there is, however, an overload because of the impact of balance changes, it can lead to more oral uh, breakdown and infections and contaminations. So our team has contributed a great deal also to uh, the oral microbiome and what happens with its um, impact on cancer development and also its impact with regards to when individuals use other chal uh, challenging, um, um, uh, let's call it ways, such as tobacco use, heavy alcohol consumption, and other. What we have found is that the oral microbiome changes so dramatically, it can certainly change reflux. It can certainly change the way that there is harmony between soft tissue and moving to a direction of pre-malignant disease. And so there's harmony that really needs to take place. An individual that has been um, substantially with tobacco use typically sees changes in the oral uh, state. And the more that an individual uses of it, the more challenging that that can actually uh, do to tissue. So again, the oral microbiome has such an amazing 
um, influence on the harmony of our GI tract and the pH of that GI tract and overall ability to digest and overall ability to control um, acidity. So we know for a fact that much of our research that we have had uh, within our institution over the last uh, 20 years has certainly shown evidence of what a healthy microbiome or a healthy gut microbiome versus a more unhealthy um, microbiome would do. And most of the time, it, it impacts and influences the immunity quite substantially. Dry mouth and its influence downstream can uh, change the life of an individual. It can certainly change because of the uh, inability to control bacteria that leads to tooth breakdown, sensitivity, fracturing of the teeth, more brittle uh, bone, more brittle soft tissue. And again, like this photo is showing so, so lovely is what actually occurs when you start to, to fissure the oral tongue because of such amazing dry mouth or whitening of the oral tongue because of the substantial drying that is actually occurring in the oral cavity. So symptoms can be where you have a impact with oral pain and discomfort and inflammation and having more acidity in the upper aerial digestive tract many times can also lead to altered taste acuity and also difficulty upon swallowing. This has a downstream impact as well, and it can thicken saliva. It can, um, again, change the uh, ability for you to digest. So what's in the top 10 list? A few of those um, top 10 reasons of why we need saliva and good healthy saliva, and it certainly begins with digestion and taste acuity, lubrication, an antimicrobial element that's so important as well of what it can do again to defend our oral cavities against periodontal disease and against caries. It protects mucosa, it can remineralize teeth, it can help us to prevent uh, cavities, and it does that through all of these ingredients that are again so important for us to help to manage the enamel of our teeth and the, uh, the balance between um, having a, a healthy um, infrastructure of the bone and the soft tissue that holds those teeth. So important. So it's important also for individuals that have had 131 therapy and or external beam radiation that there is also an impact to implants with individuals that have implants in the oral cavity that's replaced teeth. Again, <clears throat> having a drier oral cavity can also impact the health of an implant. So our management of xerostomia, we usually will start in our service once we do a workup of any individual going through a treatment that we know is going to impact the oral health. We usually will start off on something much more conservative and then manage it by other treatments that may be um, given systemically. And we traditionally try to start off with something that is going to increase oral moisture and be able to enhance that moisture to control the microbial challenges that are uh, very much going to uh, create, can, uh, create havoc on the, um, on the dentition. So we move from something that is increasing sugar-free products and or oral moisturizers or artificial salivas to then removing alcohol and phenol containing mouth rinses, which is a lot on the market. And we try our best to stay away from alcohol containing and sugar containing, sucrose containing uh, products. And then we may move ourselves up to having non-pharmacologic methods of ways to treat dry mouth, such as with, um, with stimulation of the major salivary glands. There's a variety of ways to do that, but even with masticatory function, with increasing um, a chewing gum, let's call it, that has xylitol instead of sugar. And then um, acupuncture. Um, I'll simply introduce acupuncture to you that we know that it works, particularly for those with a lower stage of dry mouth. 
We use here at MD Anderson a process that we call the 13 points of NIPCHAL. And we put that through a phenomenal study recently and just published the results. And I just presented that in Chicago recently at one of our scientific meetings um, of a data set that had about 500 individuals. And we're very proud to see what acupuncture has actually been able to do post uh, cancer treatment for our patients in enhancing uh, overall therapy uh, that is going to increase salivary function and uh, ability to have much greater swallowing efficiency. We continue to step up when an individual has substantial impact from therapy of, uh, to the oral cavity of the upper aerodigestive digestive tract again. And we may end up with moving towards pharmacotherapeutics. And there we're going to introduce what we call sialagog therapy. And we potentially will use um, medicines that are going to either impact locally or systemically. And systemical, uh, systemic pharmacotherapeutics would be treatments that we will encourage um, the glands to secrete higher volume. And we do that through a therapy that we call cholinergic agonist treatment. There are two on the market that we really like. One is called uh, polycarpine. Um, and on the market, it's actually trademarked as salogen or savimeline. And it's on the market known as Evazac. And both of these agents have had a great test of time now for the last 25 years with good data and safe data. And it is also two agents that can be very beneficial for you if you should have profound dry mouth. And particularly for those of you that wake up in the morning with very dry tissues and the tongue sticking to the mouth and your taste acuity is so markedly changed and uh, the, the products that you love so much before cancer uh, food items uh, before cancer treatment, and then after uh, cancer treatment, just don't taste the same, or you can't swallow them as you did in the past. Um, some of these agents may be very beneficial for you. So we like, of course, for dry mouth to be impacted by um, having more moisture. We like the idea that you drink more water. We like uh, beverages that have higher electrolytes. We like beverages that have less sugar. We like xylitol. We like um, the um, agents in aloe, from aloe vera called ace manin that we like. Uh, we like the idea of staying away from highly spicy foods. And again, we also uh, prefer for those that have profound dry mouth or complications in the oral cavity from a drying impact, we like for you to use salivary substitutes. So. We try our very best to discontinue products that have alcohol, high alcohol and phenol, and we traditionally will replace it with sodium bicarbonate rinse. We like the idea of what it does for alkaline, um, with alkalinizing the oral cavity. We use a simple formula on how we go about mixing it. And we think that that is so important. Um, and we know it is by our research with regards to what happens when you alkalinize the oral cavity and you decrease much of that harmful bacterial impact. Patient education, we wanna customize our oral care and we certainly want to heighten and um, bring forward um, products that are going to be kind to soft tissues, particularly those that have had treatment. And we want to use the softest bristle brushes and the kindest products that we can find that will not have substantial abrasion. And we want to enhance for some a, a rinse that can help to reduce um, gingival inflammation, such as with the chlorhexidines. Some individuals can't handle some of these products and we try to dilute those products as needed in order to have tolerability. But again, it's all about customization. And um, just to, to finish out this series, um, this, is also over-the-counter products that are quite good. We call them silagogs. We have found them to be quite excellent over the years. My go-to most of the time for increasing salivary function is through a product line that comes out of Whole Foods called Oasis. They have a full product line that can really help individuals with profound dry mouth. And again, this is, really helps to equilibrate the oral cavity. There's other ones on the market as well that have calcium and also phosphate in them. 
that can be a very good um, increased, of, uh, let's call it stimulant for salivary function for those uh, major and minor salivary glands that have been, been impacted by, uh, by treatment. The uh, calcium and the phosphate combination together can be very enhancing for not only wound healing, but also for your um, ability to stimulate salivary function. Lots, again, of agents that are out on the market that can really help to increase um, oral moisturizers, um, oral moisture. And I'll share with you that there are a considerable number of products that still have very high alcohol and also high sugar. So we really want to see that not being utilized in the oral cavity post-treatment. And we certainly want to make sure that you heighten the, the benefit of what xylitol can actually do for encouraging uh, good wound healing in the oral cavity. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk a bit about alternative treatments that are uh, ones that we've been doing in combination with other more uh, conservative measures. And acupuncture has certainly been one that we have found to be very beneficial and one, again, that we use um, in adjunct with other, um, in, with other treatments. We have found that it has greatly benefited our patients. Also, for those that get um, the glandular inflammation that is called silodenitis. And the silodenitis can be very, very painful, uh, particularly soon after iodine-131 is introduced. And silodenitis can be something that can happen even after one day of the ablation treatment. It can last for some time for some um, individuals, and it can lead to a very diminished quality of life because of the discomfort that's associated uh, with it. And so there are a great number of techniques and massage and, um, and actually other injectables that can actually help to decrease some of the inflammation that is around the overall uh, major salivary glands. And so we have found in our research that 131, that if it is greater than 100 millicuries, that it can have substantial changes to the major salivary gland tissue of the parotids that are particularly um, very sensitive to uh, radiation and radiation damage. And those are the glands that are right in front of your ears. And they can swell soon after 131 and can become very painful uh, when you're palpating them. And much um, is going to improve, particularly with massage and also with other ways to decrease that inflammation by some injectables. Many times we'll also pull out some steroid in order to try to reduce that, um, that, that glandular inflammation, but a considerable amount of it is where we will uh, gently discuss the benefit of massage uh, therapy impact. The other is through a process that we call silodenoscopy. And Dr. Stephen Lai here at MD Anderson, who is a professor in head and neck surgery, is a renowned um, surgeon and in numerous areas. But one that he has really um, helped to move uh, the knowledge is in silodenoscopy for those patients that have salivary function, uh, dysfunction. And this is where your salivary glands get impacted by the 131 and or external beam treatment by the narrowing of the ducts and also buildup of calcium and other, uh, other debris that gets into these ductal systems and really um, dis, dis, cha or challenges, let's say, the output of that gland. And so what we have found through the silodenoscopy is that it's so important to have that er diagnosed early with regard to silodenitis and encouraging silodenoscopy to be used sooner than later. And the principal goal for this is to dilate the ductal system in order to encourage greater output and flow. And this is done by introducing very small um, tubing that actually goes into the ductal systems, whether it be under the tongue or whether it be near the parotid by the ear. Um, both of these processes going through the oral cavity ducts has been very encouraging. And this is a procedure that is done um, under general anesthesia. 
And so this is the introducing a solid in a scope that you actually go and you can actually see where there's buildup and where there's ductal um, uh, atrophy and or closure. And through the dilation process, you actually can expand the ductal systems to be very much more um, productive. And this is the example. You saw some photos of what it looks like under the tongue. This is by the cheek on the upper uh, side of the, of the oral cavity. And this is introducing a, a ductal dilation through a gland um, that again is the parotid gland through its opening into the oral cavity called Stinson's duct. So dilating um, the, the glands. The next is um, once you dilate, you vacuum um, the, uh, the actual ductal system. And once you've had this dilation, you then inject a, a medicine that can help to keep the dilation prominent. And then you place into that, you usually then will put a stent at the end of the gland to keep it patent and be able to then uh, secrete much more readily. And this is something that, that stays in place for a few weeks and then is uh, removed in the office. And most of our patients have had some success uh, with it. We, we have published in several journals our data. And for the most part, what it does is it does show particularly for those individuals that have sialadenitis and the swelling around the parotid glands, that this can greatly reduce that uh, swelling and can reduce pain. In order to uh, reduce the pain, uh, reduce the pain and reducing the swelling, it usually requires an intervention. And an intervention such as this, which is more future, and again, we're doing this in combination with many other approaches, uh, this does show impact, and it should be done earlier than, uh, than much later. And what we have found is that the swelling of the sialadenitis has greatly reduced, and the xerostomia, the dry mouth, has substantially uh, reduced as well. And this is something that we have uh, now had a pretty sizable database of patients that have gone through this procedure and have shared with us that this is still working even after several years uh, post the sialadenoscopy. So something as a alternative for you to consider. And my last slide is patient education tools. There are so many great tools um, and e-instruments that you can download and read from various uh, uh, webs, websites. And these are three that I would like to introduce you to. Uh, CancerNet is one. Um, the James Wiley Corporation also has uh, great um, oral health enhancement guides. And so do we um, in our website as well. And our website is www.mdanderson.org. And this is a website that has a considerable uh, number of patient education tools that you can use and hopefully find uh, benefit from. There are some recipes that we consider to be quite practical for enhancing the oral cavity. And again, today, my presentation to you uh, was to whet the appetite a bit of what we feel is so important um, once one has cancer treatment, and now we're dealing with the side effects of treatment. And so supportive care has its role as well. In, um, in caring for our patients. And certainly I hope today this, this gave you some encouragement that there is hope and that there are ways that we go about with treating the mouth, particularly for those of you that have substantial uh, changes that have been adverse. So I wanna thank you and thank you again for allowing MD Anderson to be part of this uh, great symposium. Thank you very much, Dr. Chambers. And we have a few questions for you. Is it okay Perfect. if I go ahead and start on some? Perfect, yes, ma'am. Perfect, all right. Our first question says, does radiation therapy induced mouth dryness cause intestinal gas and or GERD? I had radiation 10 years ago and both have begun after that and still continue. Yeah, so um, the, the, the question again is about reflux disease. I didn't quite hear the beginning of the question. What was the beginning? Um, she had radiation therapy um, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, 
One thing that we have found is that um, no matter how long ago it's been that you actually have had treatment, um, intervention, any intervention that can enhance a function, particularly of the salivary output and moisturizing um, and cleanliness of the oral cavity can have a great impact in the lower digestive tract. And so I would tell you that even though that it's been that many years, that if you have not been able or ever been given a customized approach for mouth care, like I presented very briefly, I think that that is something you should consider. And many of the comprehensive cancer centers in the United States has oral oncology programs that can uh, be very beneficial for the knowledge that they've, uh, that they've gained in the types of patients that we treat. And I think that's something that you may want to pursue. Thank you. We have a, another question with a concern. Is there anything that I or my dentist can do to protect my teeth from cracking or enamel erosion? And again, they had um, radiation 10 years ago. All right, great. Yes, um, I would share that we still, even these many years outside of treatment, so strongly believe in uh, reducing the load of bacteria in the mouth by way of fluoride therapy. And so we are very strong advocates of uh, fluoride treatments and whether that be in a specific type of toothpaste or whether it be a general application that you would use that is specific to a fluoride, whether it be sodium or a stannous fluoride or an MI paste, uh, these can be very beneficial to help the health of the enamel. And it certainly can help uh, with reducing the fracturing potential of enamel and it reduces bacterial loads. And it's bacteria that causes the breakdown of teeth. It is not necessarily the agent of 131 or the radiation beam. It is truly a bacterial impact that occurs. And it occurs many times from a reduction of blood flow and salivary input and output. And then with regards to bacteria that is prominent in the oral cavity. If one has heavy, um, um, or a challenge, let's say, with tobacco use and has that also as a added uh, challenge to the head and neck area, it can also worsen the health of the dentition or of the gum tissue or the bone. So again, the, uh, the, sh the, the long answer was what I just gave. The short answer is, is that you can benefit even 10 years later from an enhancement with fluoride application and or customization based on the, the needs that you have. Oh, thank you. We have another question here. Um, is there any way to do microflora monitoring in a dental office? Can this be done at the cancer center? Um, what, what do you suggest? Yeah, um, most of the centers in the United States, um, most of the larger centers, and even in rural America, um, we have the ability to do microbial assessment by way of an easy swab, that we do a, a, a quick buckle swab of the oral cavity, and it's sent off to a local micro lab. We, we have our own here at MD Anderson, and it comes back and it really tells us what's there. And so today it's so practical to actually have that done, and many dental offices have that ability, and many will send it out, and particularly if you um, are interested in that. Some that um, do it very proactively, others will be more reactive to your desire of having an assessment of the, of the oral cavity. And so again, I think that this is something that you would traditionally see in the larger centers um, that we would want to have a baseline uh, to determine the microbial contamination of the mouth. And again, you can also ask that same question to your local dentist if they have the ability to be able to send off a swab uh, to determine what you do indeed have. There are three major contaminating uh, bacteria that lead to substantial periodontal breakdown. We see it routinely, and we see it across many institutions in the United States, whether it's east, south, north, or, or, uh, or on the west side. 
what we traditionally will see is um, a bacteria called mutans strepococci. And that is a very difficult organism to try to, um, to contain if it has gotten quite rampant. The others are um, more uh, and, and probably easier to, um, to, to change. One is called lactobacillus, and it's a organism that with the right uh, way of, of cleaning the oral cavity, particularly with a fluoride uh, toothpaste, you usually will destroy the lactobacillus quite easily. And then there's another one called acto, uh, atenomyces, and it is also an organism that can, uh, that's gentle and easy to destroy. Uh, you can destroy it by, uh, by most routine over-the-counter toothpaste. And again, staph, um, staph and strep uh, typically are normal in our normal flora, but in a drier mouth, they're much more prominent. So the organism that we really want to control is mutans. And so that's one that you really want to know whether that's in high concentration and uh, when your uh, report comes back of seeing where it stands in the normal range, if it's much above the normal range um, or below. Good question. Perfect. We have another one. Does RAI-123 differentiate from RAI-131? Are the same effect from the salivary glands or one better or worse? Right, that's a, that's a phenomenal question. I will say that in our experience, actually 131 tends to have uh, the longest record because we know more about it and we know more in our data set of its impact downstream. And I would say at the moment, it seems to be that 131 is uh, usually will cause the, the, the more challenging manifestations in the oral cavity. I can't say that's true for elsewhere, but I certainly can say that uh, to be true for what it does towards sialadenitis and the swelling of the glands in the head and neck. We see much stronger impact with 131 uh, than the other uh, radioactive iodines. We have um, another question. Someone had 194 MCI in December of 2020, but for the last two weeks had pain and swelling in the left salivary gland. They've done the heat, massage, the lemon drops, um, and is seeing an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Do you suggest anything else or a different specialist or resource? Um, it's not improving. Oh, it's a shame. Yes, and, and that is very frustrating, isn't it? Because pain in that region, it can be um, very frightening also because you don't know where it's coming from and you're trying to get to the source of the matter. Yes, I think that um, with that dosing that you've had, it certainly can fluctuate even years um, after your, your therapy for salivary gland tissue to actually inflame for whatever reason. And sometimes it actually inflames because there is a calculus buildup, a tartar buildup in the, um, in the ducts. And it leads to that swelling and it definitely has pain associated with it. I think a scintigraphy, uh, gland, a, a scintigraphy scan would be quite good for you to go through so that it could show the productivity and the uh, overall influence of, of your secretions and see what type of activity you have in your major salivary glands. That's a very good st start point, in my opinion, for uh, a diagnostic workup. Okay, um, I had RC, uh, sorry, REI three weeks ago. Um, oops, that's <laughs> my slide jump. Um, and I have a lot of side effects that you talked about. I'm supposed to get a crown in two weeks. Did I wait or what do you suggest? No, go for it. <laughs> no, I think right. that is a good thing to do. And I'm so happy you're under the dental care. And uh, I do believe that you would benefit from being on a fluoridated uh, treatment. And I strongly am a advocate for Prevident 5000 toothpaste. Prevident 5000 is a dentifrice that is used in a lot of offices. And it has a lot of data on what it does for many of our mouths um, when you have had some alteration. Um, you know, there's, it, it, it's, 
it's more than 131 or more than radioactive iodine. It's more than external beam radiation treatment. It's many of us, as you get older and you're taking medicines that are going to regulate heart and lung and diabetes, these are all agents that also give some drying impact to the oral cavity. And many I've heard for years, you know, you reach the 50 age mark and 60, and all of a sudden it seems as if things are falling apart. And I will share with you that some of that is true by the age, most unfortunately, but I will share also that uh, the Prevident 5000 toothpaste is so beneficial for controlling bacterial loads in the mouth and also remineralizing teeth. And so after getting that crown, I think it would be quite good to have a prescription given of the Prevident 5000. It's something that could be such a great adjunct uh, for overall improving oral health. I'm gonna add my two cents worth in. I've had external beam and radiation and I have the Prevident and it made a huge difference. Um, and one of the questions asked why everything is mint flavored and I'm gonna tell you the Prevident comes in a nice bubble gum. Yes. And a flavor. So you're not limited there either for those of you who don't necessarily like that. And we have time for just kind of one more last question here, um, sort of related. Um, she asks, they do recommended the Nim Chow and other lectures and she says she searched in the LA area with no success. Is there another name for this type of acupuncture or a different procedure that you think would help? Yeah, there is, uh, that's a great question. The uh, the acupuncture, there is um, one that is called, of course, the ones we use mostly here at MD Anderson at Memorial Sloan Kittering is called the 13 points of Nip Chow. But there are, um, there are 14 points that are also used specifically for salivary function. And that's where many master acupuncturists, that's actually what they know. Um, the, the prescription is by way of enhancing salivary function. And so that's the way I would go about it with making sure that you would go to an office of a master acupuncturist that's accredited. And there are a great number of accredited um, uh, acupuncturists throughout the world. And there are a lot that are not. And so I would highly recommend board certified and or accredited uh, master acupuncturists for you to go to their, uh, to their um, individual services, or I would uh, recommend for you to go to place of wellnesses that are in many rural uh, hospitals and our comprehensive cancer centers. And um, I'm really glad you're experimenting with that. Keep, keep trying. And also, can you repeat the bicarb recipe again? Sure. So bicarbonate rinse, uh, we traditionally like for you to use um, a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate in about 10 ounces of water. And that is good for um, two days worth of rinsing. Fantastic. And that is all we have time for. I'm sorry we did not get a chance to answer all the questions. Um, we will refer them on. I know you have to head out to surgery right I now. Do. I do. So, but thank you so much for your time and all your efforts you've done for helping us. So thank you very much. Great. I'm so glad all of you were participating. Thank you so much, Barb, for, for hosting me and great job today. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Take bye care. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you all for attending. We'll see you at the next session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.